It's that time of time of week again, Sunday, 6 p.m. Pacific. Welcome to Steve's Place. Uh, tonight um, we'll be featuring uh, Charlie Charlie Weiss, our pardon me, Charlie uh, Zies, who is the um, head of Stargate Pyramid and also uh, uh, Pyramid Science. I know it's called Pyramid Science. And then you have uh, George Leoniak. Who also has a website called uh, New Geometry, and we'll be featuring them. But for now, um, let me bring up uh, our magazine, Extraordinary Science and Technology. I'd like to encourage everyone um, uh, to think about getting some of our back issues. We have a lot of good material in these uh, magazines. Uh, this one here. You can download uh, this uh, excerpt, you know, from our uh, last week's show with Andrew Batty, and it's the plans for the hydrogen truck, trucker cells here. Uh, for those who are interested in uh, Joe cells and that, and I'd be remiss without talking about uh, becoming a member of the Tesla Tech YouTube channel. Um, our Tesla Tech YouTube channel has 30 years of um, Innovative ideas and in health and energy, folk um, with a focus on Tesla technology. Uh, I encourage everyone to become uh, at least subscribed. Subscriptions are free, and that gives you access to like you know about 200 uh, videos. Plus, uh, you get notified when we add stuff on there. And uh, if you become a again exclusive membership, it's 9.99 a month, and that gives you access to all of our videos. Okay. And um, that we have up there, close to a 1,000. Uh, we have the Extraordinary Technology Conferences, Exotic Research Conferences, and Global Science Conferences. And uh, we still got about half the Global Sciences Conferences up there. We got more to go. And then we, uh, we'll be doing uh, some Tesla Society stuff, probably, and also uh, the Conference on Free Energy. So we have a lot of stuff coming up, and we have a lot of stuff up there. Please become a member. Uh, of the exclusive membership, when you go up there to join, make sure you get the exclusive membership for nine ninety nine. Uh, it helps us uh, continue doing these conferences. And that, and speaking of conferences, we have the twenty twenty three Extraordinary Technology Conference coming up August ninth to thirteenth at the Crown Plaza in Albuquerque, New Mexico. It's a live in person event. We have special hotel rates. You know. Um, uh, we ask you to register now. We have a 35% discount. Uh, just call the number below uh, after the show or go up to our website, www.testthetech.info, and uh, check out our uh, our conference page. We are uh, starting to fill out the, uh, the program at this time. Uh, if you want to speak at the conference, you need to get an abstract in to be considered. You know, uh, we do everything off the conferences. Anyway, uh, without further ado, uh, let me introduce Charlie um, Zies. And um, hold on just a second. This is Charlie and okay. uh, George Leoniak. Let me see. And there's George. They're all there. You know, okay. And, uh, Thanks, Steve. Thank and like I said, Charlie, you're with the uh, Pyramid uh, Science Group, right? And, yeah, I'm the. Um, and George yeah, with yeah. New Geometry. And I'm going to turn it over to you, Charlie. And uh, okay. And then we'll be getting started right there. Is that okay. Pause okay. in your course. All right. Well, thanks. Well, thanks. Yeah, yeah, as as Steve was. As Steve was saying, I'm I own a company called Stargate Pyramids, where I make. Uh, healing and meditation pyramids. We'll talk about that later, but they're based upon the the Russian pyramid research that was popularized by David Wilcox six or seven years ago. And I'm also, uh, a couple of years ago, I put together a 501c3 nonprofit called the Pyramid Science Foundation. And its purpose is to do research and disseminate the results on um, uh, pyramid energy field. So that's just an introduction to my background. Uh, George Leoniak, as we mentioned, he's uh, the owner of uh, New Geometry on um, 
uh, YouTube and is an expert sacred geometer. So what we're going to be talking about today, early, last year, I about mid-year, I published a book uh, that is based upon a single geometric angle. Uh, and I called it 76.345, which is the angle that we're going to be talking about this evening. And that's the angle of the phi spiral, as it turns out, in nature. And so uh, the reason why that's important, you're going to see, is for, for several reasons. One, I, uh, well, in fact, we'll just get into the slides and, and you can see, see why this is important. As it turns out, uh, one of the key things that I found in the, uh, my research, which took about three years to, to put together, was that civilizations around the world have used sacred geometry for free energy and healing for literally for thousands of years, and yet we are unaware of it. Uh, evidence of this can be found hiding in plain sight in architecture all around the world. Uh, it's in hieroglyphs, it's in technology, both ancient and current, and it's in the sacred geometry diagrams that George will talk about later. Uh, and the, the phi spiral itself, which is essentially the geometry that this is going to be based on, is a classic example of this hidden sacred geometry technology around the world and in nature. So, uh, for those of you who under, know a little bit about torsion physics, Nikolai Kozarev is considered to be the father of torsion physics, and he proved the existence of torsion of, of, of spiraling torsion fields back in the 1950s, and that really his work serves as the basis for uh, you know contemporary torsion physics. And uh, more importantly, for our purposes today, Victor Schauberger used spirals in water as the inspiration for his free energy technologies. So there's a lot to cover tonight, but the probably the most important thing that I want to stress beyond the science that we're going to talk about is the fact that our knowledge of sacred geometry has been suppressed in large part because the study of what's called the quadrivium, this was Plato's advanced uh, areas of study, which combined mathematics uh, geometry, harmonics, and cosmology. Uh, that was no longer taught at the beginning of the Renaissance. And so we've lost all of this ancient knowledge, I think, in large part due to the suppression of this that started at the beginning of the Renaissance. So it's really a tragedy because, in my view, uh, uh, the quadrivium teaches first principles, first truths that... Uh, you know, help us to understand who we are and, and our place in, in, in the universe. But all of that has essentially been taken away from us through the suppression of this ancient knowledge. So to start with, what I want to do is to show you how I derived the uh, 76.345 degree geometry. If you look on this page, you'll see on the left a picture of the Russian pyramids that were built over the last 30 years. Uh, they were funded in large part by the uh, Russian government who was looking for inexpensive ways to improve health and uh, uh, energy uh, technology uh, through the building of these pyramids. So the, the first thing I had to do was, if I wanted to make them was to figure out, well, what is the geometry? And, and the Russians had told us that uh, uh, the golden ratio was involved in these pyramids, but we didn't know what it was because, quite honestly, this research has been uh, prohibited from being published in the West. So I essentially had to back into this. On the left, you'll see I, it's, it may be hard to see in this slide, but each at the bottom, I've got a, a, a number of the 76.345 that shows up. The, that was the angle that I measured with an online protractor app. You can see the second picture. That's the, the geometry or the angle that I make in my own pyramids, and that's an example of that. But what I when I had to figure out the geometry, I came up with an idea of in my mind of a, a spiral, a phi spiral vortex uh, circling around uh, in three dimensions, uh, spheres in two dimensions, circles uh, whose diameters 
themselves were decreasing as you went up the vertical plane by the golden ratio itself. So if you look over at the, the diagram second from the right, you'll see we start with a, a, a circle in two dimensions of a diameter of one. And then we divide that by the golden ratio and we end up with a diameter of 0.618 and then 0.382, 0.236 and so forth. That could theoretically extend to infinity uh, inside this diagram. This uh, uh, idea or this approach allows for infinite scaling. Uh, and when you uh, put the sides of the triangle on after you've built those circles or spheres in three dimensions, you find out that the base angle called either the slant or slope angle uh, is 76.345 degrees. Now, one thing I'm also going to say here, uh, just so you notice, I have put in three dots at the end of that. This is not a, a, a pre precise figure because it's based on the golden ratio itself. This is an infinite irrational number. And so I've used that designation of the three dots to, uh, to make that clear to, to the audience. So after I figured that uh, out, I said, well, what the, one of the first things that I always hear from people is, well, how come your pyramids look so different than the Giza pyramid? That's the one that most people are familiar with. And when I went and looked at it, I found out a very, very interesting fact. Uh, I plotted on the left there the, the Russian pyramid, which is the taller one. Uh, but I've also uh, plotted the, the Giza pyramid uh, inside of that. They, given a common base length, uh, that's the way they, the proportions look when you graph it. And what you find, if you can see, I'm pointing with my cursor now to point F, that's the uh, angle of 76,345, that's the slant or slope angle of the Russian pyramid. But sure enough, if you look up at point E here, you're going to see that the apex angle of the Giza pyramid is exactly the same down to three significant digits. And George is going to show you those relationships between these uh, two pyramid types uh, in his part of the presentation. But suffice it to say, I didn't know George at the time. George and I only met about two months ago. So all I could tell at this point was I knew this was going to be significant, but I wasn't sure exactly why. But if you'll notice, there's uh, the golden ratio is in all of the height relationships uh, and slant height relationships of these pyramids. So the golden ratio is key to the development of these pyramids. Now, the next thing I found and I think this is important for people to, to grasp is the significance of this geometric angle in nature. Uh, on the left, we see the refraction of light through a glass sphere uh, actually occurs at this very angle of 76.345 degrees. We're going to see that uh, even though we can't see sound, we can measure the geometry of a megaphone which amplifies that sound and sure enough we get the very same geometric angle. Uh, in the third example we have a spiraling water vortex and there again we see that geometry in the, in the spiraling of water and the vortexing of water and finally we find that geometry in our DNA. So this is clearly a fundamental property, uh, scaling property of the universe is contained in this very number of 76.345 degrees. Now, what I want to do is to, to take that knowledge and now show to this audience, because I know you're interested in free energy and health, uh, some of the 20th, three classic examples of 20th century free energy technology and health technology that use this geometry. The Russian pyramid research is certainly one of those. Uh, this research, uh, we have just the abstracts from them. We don't have the actual underlying papers. As I said, they were not allowed to be published, but we do have this information that uh, these pyramids put off, this, this Russian pyramid puts off an enormous ionization field. And we're going to find out that that's key to free health here in a little bit. But uh, 
if that ionization field were to be reproduced electromagnetically, it would require all of the electric generating capacity in the entire country of Russia to reproduce the level of ionization that comes off of one of these pyramids. So we know that it's a very powerful uh, geometry. Uh, capacitors that were attached to the top of these pyramids immediately charged spontaneously and they blew upward into the sky uh, because on, on top of this powerful energy vortex energy field that was being produced by the pyramids. And the energy field itself could be detected up to 185 miles. And finally, uh, the research indicates that there were amazing increases in immune function, life expectancy, agricultural production, uh, environmental remediation. There were tremendous results that came about as a result of this. So uh, again, this is all occurring with this geometry. Now, another example of the use of this geometry, as I mentioned, Victor Schauberger was familiar with spirals as well. And he developed a number of free energy technologies. Uh, this is an example of his Vortex home power generator, which was uh, reputed to get 10 times over unity. And you can see, I mean, literally lifting up the hood, so to speak, you know, lifting off the section that Victor's holding up now, you find this imploder, uh, which used water as the source of its free energy, you know, uh, but uh, it used exactly this same 76 345 geometry. So uh, just another example. Here are some other examples of Victor Schauberger's uh, spirals. He was a big fan of observing nature. And if we start at the top right hand corner, he, liked to, he looked at the fish in the water and he realized that this angle uh, existed both in the top view and the side view of trout uh, that he studied extensively. And sure enough, when I went to measure it, 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 it came in at the 76, 345 degree angle. Uh, if you look in the bottom right hand corner, this is some technology that Schauberger put together to increase the flow of water through some wooden pipes. And sure enough, we find that 76, 345 uh, geometry once again in the, in the spirals uh, occurring inside the water pipes. Uh, in the middle, we have something called the repulsine. I don't know that this was ever actually built, but this is a drawing of his. Uh, and he, of course, was a master of implosion technologies and uh, the creation of vacuums. So really he was sucking, the, the idea here is to suck that object through space rather than to push it, which is uh, more of an explosive technology that we use currently. But you'll see that that angle exists there as well in, that, in those diagrams. And finally on the left, this is a, uh, these are some diagrams of what's called a Heinkel jet aircraft. This was the first jet aircraft that was ever built in the world. Uh, Heinkel apparently stole a lot of his technology from Schauberger. And one of those uh, thefts included using this 76 345 geometry uh, in the uh, Heinkel aircraft that he, uh, that he built. Another example uh, is Nikola, Nikola Tesla's Wardenclyffe Tower. Uh, Tesla course, uh, used uh, earth energies uh, to power his tower. But interestingly enough, there, uh, the, the angle of the tower that uh, he actually built incorporates the 76 345 geometry as well. So we've got basically three examples there of 20th century technology that's using this geometry. Now, more recently, I've started to look at some other uh, examples of, of free energy technology. I just started looking at John Keeley's work in the last couple of weeks, and I noticed that a number of the diagrams that he that are in um, Dale Pond's uh, book on uh, Keeley's work uh, have this uh, 76 345 geometric angle as well. 
We can see it here in this uh, vortex diagram on the left. On the right, this was the angle of some uh, water tubes that he used uh, in his uh, free one of his free energy devices. Uh, here's some other examples uh, where we found this geometry in these actini actinic uh, rays, actinic rays, I guess, um, and also uh, this diagram as well. I've got some calls into Dale Pond, who wrote this book, and I hoping to get in touch with him to get more insights. But you can find this geometric angle is showing up in all of these free energy devices. And so a, a, a thing to think about is, well, what happened to all of these technologies? They all use this 76, 345 angle, but the Russian pyramid research was not allowed to be published in the West. Uh, Victor Schauberger's work you know, after World War II, he had to work for Hitler uh, designing anti-gravity machines and uh, other types of uh, military apparatus. But uh, he was forced under duress to license all of his technologies to American business interests. We don't know exactly what happened to all of those. The government may have those now, but they are not in the public domain. Uh, Nikola Tesla's research, as we are probably all aware, was seized by the U.S. government. Uh, following his death, and Achilles research uh, using uh, what he called sympathetic uh, vibrational uh, physics uh, was there was a concerted effort after his death to discredit his work and to say that he was a fraud. And also um, his research papers were ultimately shipped to the Theosophical Society, and they really haven't been seen since then. So. Essentially, all four of these technologies use this geometry, uh, and yet we don't have access uh, to, you know, the basic uh, research on any of these technologies. Now, here's another example of, of this uh, geometry in action for those who are familiar with Coral Castle. Edward Leedsgallen, one of the major things people always ask is, well, how is he able to lift those gigantic pieces of coral by himself. Uh, a lot of people know that he had some, some interesting theories on magnetism and that there was a black box literally at the top of uh, these tripods. But interestingly enough, I, uh, uh, a reader uh, sent this in to me recently, or a viewer, and uh, uh, so I wanted to show you this as well. For those who are interested in uh, Leith Gallen's work, and how it may may actually have functioned, uh, you should start to give this some some uh, serious consideration. When I have some time, I want to learn more about Leitz Gallen's work as well, and see if I can develop a theory as to how this geometry fits into his principles. Now I'm going to take you back to some ancient, uh, more ancient uh, diagrams. Uh, as, as you can see here, it, 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 and you're going to see in the next few slides, uh, it, it certainly doesn't look like Thomas Edison invented the light bulb because this is an example of a street scene in Paris from 1739 uh, indicating illumination. And as you can see, it looks as though a pyramidal object with this very exact geometric angle is being used to, most likely to generate the power for this scene of illumination in Paris. We have another example uh, similar in Paris in 1799. Uh, this is from the Champs d'Elysees in Paris. And you can see in the picture on the left, there are two pyramidal objects uh, in the background along with this uh, obelisk looking uh, structure. But the two pyramidal objects, once again, have this 76, 345 geometry, again, most likely heavily involved in the creation of this uh, free energy technology. Now, all of the obelisks, um, you all are probably aware that obelisks are theorized to be uh, part of uh, certain types of free energy technologies as well. Every single obelisk that comes from Europe uh, has this geometry at the top. And so 
I would assume that the free energy aspect of it has a lot to do with the geometric angle at the top of the pyramid of the of the obelisks. Now here's here's uh, an on the left we're going to see an ancient uh, temple of Karnak hieroglyph. I've got many examples more of the of all of these in my book, but George is going to show that not only uh, that but also the Aztec calendar, and you're going to find some just amazing. Uh, results uh, that George has found now that we uh, are looking at this angle seriously and you're going to see how that all relates to this geometry in his part of the presentation. Now I want to start to kind of go back uh, and look at a lot of the various places around the world and types of structures that have this geometry. This is what's called a nuragi. This is uh, from the island of Sardinia in uh, the Mediterranean Ocean. It's actually part of Italy, uh, Sardinia. But um, these naragis, uh, there's estimates that anywhere from 10 to 20,000 of these were made on the island. Every one of them that I've looked at has this geometry. And the reason why this is significant is twofold. One, there were, uh, there were all, almost always uh, graves, uh, grave sites of giants that were uh, next to these naragis. And given what we are going to be, be demonstrating about this geometry, it may be that this geometric angle is, is uh, forming the energy field in such a cohesive way that the uh, entities who live there grew to be giants. We don't know. But one thing that we do know about uh, contemporary society, Sardinia is a blue zone, which is an area of highest life expectancy uh, on the planet. And so I think that that has a lot to do with the existence of these naragis, because George is going to be showing you in a model later on that this is a model that uh, it fits inside the torus. It uh, creates. It's. It, it's. It's. We're going to develop that model for you. That this is the uh, organizing principles of the universe. Include the torus, this geometry, and uh, uh, some scaling uh, that we're going to talk about later. Other uh, examples. Uh, all of the ancient brocks in Scotland have this geometry. Uh, the great Zimbabwe ruins in, in Africa have this. This is a great example of, of healing technologies as well. In 2020, Michael Tellinger and Dr. Sam Osmanagic, they actually measured the field of the ionization field of this conical structure. And it was the highest uh, that they had ever, uh, I guess, measured up until that point. Research at the University of London which is corroborated by the Russian pyramid research, indicates that ionization creates highly improved immune function. And I'm just going to say as an aside, I haven't been sick a day since I started building these pyramids, and I attribute that completely to the existence of these energy fields. Uh, here's an example of what we call castles. I, or this one is called a castle. I would call it a fort. It has this geometry, as many of them around the world do. And I'm, I'm, I'm making a point here on the left, the meme that we see here. This is what we've been taught to believe, that this was kind of some kind of a you know, way to fight you know, your enemies from up top, kind of like cowboys and Indians or medieval style here. But what I'm going to throw out, hopefully to expand people's minds, since we know that this is an energy generating geometry, could the top of these forts and castles actually be some sort of a square wave that could be used for either the transmission or reception of energy or information? So just uh, something to be thinking about as we proceed. Now, here's an example of a, a Buddhist temple in India. Uh, this is the Mahabodhi Buddhist temple. You're going to see that the temple itself has this geometry in the main body of the, of the temple. And we're also going to see a coil, 
uh, which is characteristic of many of these temples uh, in uh, India and Asia, uh, which has this geometry as well. So these were all theorized to be uh, energy generating technologies. We're going to see several examples of these. This is the Vishnu Shanti Temple in uh, uh, Delhi, India. Uh, may have been that they were uh, getting a vibration from the earth with this hemispherical um, uh, part of the, uh, of the temple. But once again, we're going to see a coil at the top uh, with the 76 345 geometry. And we're also going to see a fractal antenna here. So we're seeing it. We just continue to see this geometry in the context of ancient buildings with this um, technology. This is the uh, this is one of uh, many Gothic cathedrals. Uh, I looked at every single Gothic cathedral uh, that was at least listed in Wikipedia, and I found that about two thirds of the cathedral Gothic cathedrals had steeples with this technology. Now I picked this one out just as an example, uh, but it has this geometry and it's also on the right, you see uh, this Antiquitech, this uh, could be some sort of, a, of an electric uh, accumulation. Maybe it's a, um, a capacitor system of some sort, but it was used in the production of free energy. So the information that George and, uh, and I are, are developing, we hope maybe to, to be able to figure out all of the geometries. Uh, but I know that the vast majority of the balance that aren't this geometry uh, have other golden ratio related geometries. Fascinating information in and of itself. There is no uh, information on the sacred geometry of these steeples that's ever been published, either by churches or in secular uh, research. So, you know, when we get all this done, and many, many of these examples are in my book, uh, you know, we may do a separate uh, research study on the geometry of these steeples. Every castle in the world that I have been able to uh, look at has this geometry as well. Uh, this is an example of a technology where you see uh, you see the 76 345 geometry, but you see it in this in a central location with four smaller uh, steeples coming out on each side. And this again was a, a, a type of free energy technology. You'll see up at the top there were both there's both an antenna on top of the this Königsberg uh, castle as well as a uh, mercury ball. Uh, which was part of the free energy technology. Uh, here is uh, San Marco Bell Tower in Venice, Italy. Uh, this bell tower is an example of, or is, was used as uh, to, to develop many, many uh, bell towers around the world, as we saw from the megaphone earlier. All of these bell towers have this geometry because it helps to amplify and clarify uh, the sound that's created from the tower. Now we're, we're going to look at some Tartarian architecture. Uh, Tartarian architecture, this is a, 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 a worldwide empire that uh, is theorized to have existed. There are maps back to the uh, 16th century that have this empire covering all of uh, <coughs> current day Russia, India, the Middle East, uh, Eastern Europe, North, North and Central America, and it possibly was a worldwide culture. But this is the uh, St. Basil's Cathedral in um, uh, Moscow. Many people think of this as the Kremlin because it's uh, been kind of brought in as part of the Kremlin compound. But you'll see these were all free energy devices. Uh, these towers all have the 76 345 geometry. Uh, there were other technologies at work here as well. These onion domes, the green and blue uh, domes here. We have fractal antennas. Uh, we have what could be metal ball repositories here as well. So we had lots of different technology at work, uh, indicative of a very advanced uh, civilization that put these together. Here, here's a picture of Red Square, which shows this geometry everywhere. 
uh, you know, along the bit or in the buildings on Red Square. Uh, here's another example. This is called the Annunciation Cathedral. I have a whole section in my book that deals with free energy technologies. And one of the common characteristics of many churches in Europe and uh, mosques as well is the existence of this uh, red and white or black and white uh, horizontal striping. And so I picked this one as another example of Tartarian architecture. In addition to having the geometry, this particular uh, Annunciation Cathedral also has some outstanding examples of fractal antennas. You can see as well the, the, the lines that are coming down uh, from these. These were electrical lines that generally ran into the ground and was part of a, a free energy collection technology. Here's just briefly some examples of headwear. Uh, on the left, we have, uh, this is uh, Lord Vishnu, one of the uh, three principal Hindu male deities. All of the Hindu deities, uh, as well as the Buddha, you know, are, are depicted with headwear with this geometry. So this was significant in the East. Uh, the center uh, picture is actually from the Wizard of Oz. This is the hat worn by the Wicked Witch of the West. Uh, this geometry goes back uh, to uh, medieval times uh, and uh, continued through to co contemporary society as well. All the witch and wizard hats have always had this geometry as well. And uh, on the right, we see a dunce cap. The dunce cap was actually developed in the 13th century as an example, or based upon the witch and wizard hats of the day by a 13th century Franciscan monk named John Dun Scotus. But uh, so what we're, you know, just again, we've got many, many more examples in the book, but this is showing you that mankind knew about this and used this geometry in every way possible for creation of free energy, or in this case, to get a, a higher connection to the higher self. Now, now I'm moving into some 19th century technology. This is a, uh, a, an example of an iron furnace. Before the steel industry began in the late 1800s, uh, iron furnaces cropped up all around the United States. It started in uh, actually in Pennsylvania, where I live. Uh, this particular one's only about 15 miles from where I live, but these were the mainstay of uh, you know, the iron industry in the United States and every single one of these iron furnaces uses this 76.345 geometry. And why is that? It's organizing the field in such a way that it's maximizing airflow through the system and maximizing the uh, temperature uh, achieved inside the furnace. Uh, here's an offshoot technology of that. Uh, this is called the Sibley Tent Stove. This is another 19th century technology that was invented by Henry Hopkins Sibley. He invented this whole tent uh, and this, uh, this uh, tent stove could be uh, placed inside the tent, vented outside and used very little fuel. And uh, the troops were able to stay warm in the wintertime through the use of this, uh, of this stove. Now, another 19th century technology that uh, I, you know, I, I came across this by accident, but I remembered it from organic chemistry class in college, and that's the Erlenmeyer flask. And you would think, well, why would we see this geometry in something as mundane as a flask? Well, as it turns out, uh, Emil Erlenmeyer is uh, an organic chemistry who learned a uh, was, is known for a lot of his research in developing double bonds in the organic chemistry world. And that's really an increase in the energy that's put into these, into these molecular structures. And sure enough, as it turns out, apparently Erlenmeyer figured out that this geometry uh, was great at helping to, to uh, organize this chemical reaction in the vertical plane and to allow for the creation of these double bonds, thereby increasing uh, the energy inherent in these organic compounds. 
Native Americans knew about this angle as well, because we see it in both the fletching, which is the back feathers, as well as the arrowheads of the uh, arrows that they uh, used for hunting. And uh, here we have an example of, uh, uh, we're having to run through this in a hurry, but church steeples after the Gothic cathedrals became largely in the neo-Gothic period uh, imitative in style. And, but that was very, very popular in the late uh, 1800s. But by the early 1900s, this classic geometry of church steeple uh, uh, was eliminated from our culture in the West. Now, what's fascinating is that today, even though this was the mainstay geometry of church steeples in, all over the world, uh, in the Eastern and Russian Orthodox churches as well, they maintain it to this day, but after the early 1900s, it disappeared from uh, Western Christianity. And in fact, today, there's not a single steeple manufacturer in the United States that actually makes a stock steeple uh, based on this geometry. However, uh, although all other churches have gotten rid of this in Western Christianity, uh, the Mormon church, which was founded by Masons, and therefore they use this extensively, they continue to use this in their church uh, steeples uh, to this day. But essentially, after the beginning of the 1900s in, in, in you know, what we'd call you know, secular, even in religious uh, architecture in the West, this angle disappears, but it remains alive and well in our technology, which is fascinating because we don't teach sacred geometry in our engineering classes. It might have saved a lot of time and money doing all these experiments to find this geometry, uh, or it may be that those you know on the inside know about this, uh, but no matter, we find this in technology everywhere. This is an example of a power plant cooling tower. These are used in both nuclear and coal-fired plants that use uh, that take the heat generated from those processes, those burning processes, and create steam. But you need to cool down the water, and is it with these cooling towers? And this is a this is the geometry that uh, again speeds up that process, optimizes airflow, and therefore maximizes the cooling of the steam that's created, so that that water can be uh, cooled back down and reused again. Now, all of our current day aerospace technology has this geometry in the nose cones of uh, this is a Saturn I rocket. Uh, this is a MiG-29 jet aircraft from Russia. Uh, uh, Elon Musk uses it in SpaceX. Uh, the Russians used it in uh, their Sputnik aircraft way back in the 60s. Uh, interestingly enough as well, bullet, all of the bullets that uh, you know we use around the world has this geometry as well. And uh, interesting as well, uh, you notice these marks here, this is called rifling. Uh, rifling is a process, if you look at this little inset picture, the barrel of a rifle is going to have these spiraling um, uh, tubes in there. And that creates a spiraling effect on the um, bullet itself, and that helps to keep its uh, to maintain its accuracy as it proceeds through the air. So we we see this geometry and technology everywhere today. Uh, the last example I'm going to show you is a hypersonic uh, concept vehicle called the Lockheed Martin SR-72, and you see this 76 345 geometry in this technology as well. So that's the end of the pictures that I'm going to show you that, but that should, you know, if you're interested, we'll show you, you know, how you can get the book later. There's hundreds more examples of this, but now I want to kind of set this up so that you can begin to uh, get an appreciation of some of the other information that I was able to glean over the last several years as I was doing research on architecture and, and nature. But what I found was that there are many, many things that magically seem to fit within this magic geometry 
of this this 76.345 angle. And one of them is the scaling of fractals. For those of you who are familiar with the uh, with fractals, this is a, a particularly uh, uh, you know common uh, diagram called the, Ma uh, uh, the the Mandelbrot set. Benoit Mandelbrot is credited with rediscovering uh, uh, fractals in the 1970s, although they actually go back to the ancient Hindu temples. But we don't have time to go through that. But what's interesting uh, for our discussion here is that. The Mandelbrot set these little circles turn out that they uh, scale in phi cubed. Uh, if you see the very tiny circle on the left there, that's phi. And then if you go to the next circle, that's uh, a length of phi cubed. Then the next circle is scaled to phi to the sixth power. And the last circle uh, was, would scale to phi to uh, the ninth power. So what we're going to find here, this is what we're finding is that phi cubed is equal to, I hope I'm not losing too many people here with, with math, but with uh, it's equal to 4.236 dot, dot, dot. And that's equal to the slant height ratio that we found in the Russian pyramids and all of these other 76, 345 uh, technologies. Now, even more exciting was when I found out that the platonic solids also scale in phi cubed. This was perhaps the most important uh, uh, piece of information that I think uh, I found in, in quite some time. I found this diagram on the left in Robert Lawler's book, uh, Sacred Geometry, Philosophy and Practice. And essentially what it is, it's a diagram in two dimensions that shows the platonic solids uh, with inter inscribing and circumscribing circles in two dimensions. And uh, you can't see it here, but Lawler gives us a list of the, the lengths uh, of the sides of each of these platonic solid diagrams. And anyway, when you uh, do the mathematics on this, uh, on this uh, diagram, you find out that uh, I'm sure most of your audience is familiar with the idea of the progression of the platonic solids, but there are five major platonic solids, the icosahedron, octahedron, tetrahedron, cube, and dodecahedron. And then there are stellations and, and, uh, that uh, George is going to get into as well. But essentially, when you go from one icosahedron to the next, the idea being that these change in size and, and, and they're changed from one form to another, but it's like octaves on the keyboard on the piano. So when you look at the difference in the circumscribing diameters of the, the circles, uh, you find that once again, we find this phi cube scaling uh, uh, in the platonic solids as well. So now we know that both platonic solids and fractals scale at the same, at the same scaling rate. And finally, what I found was this picture of the torus. Most of you are familiar with the idea of the torus. The torus is, has been theorized for a long time to be the organizational process that uh, is used both from the subatomic to the galactic to, uh, to create our physical reality. Well, sure enough, as it turns out, when you've most of the pictures that you see of tori or tauruses in uh, on uh, YouTube or on Bing Images, uh, they're not really spherical. But this particular one I found, I know is spherical, and it is uh, because it's the physical award given for what's called the Breakthrough Prize in Fundamental Physics. There are some uh, videos on YouTube that demonstrate that this is a, a spherical uh, torus. And sure enough, when I went to measure this, what, what happened? I found the 76345 geometry in uh, this as well. So what came to my mind, this was right before I was I met George a couple, you know, a couple of months ago. I put all this information together right before I published the book and I just started to to point in this direction. I want, you know, could it be that we could develop a model? of scaling 
using the geometry of, of, of the 76 345 pyramid and place that inside the torus and come up with a dynamic model for scaling, which includes the ability to scale both fractals and the platonic solids. And that's essentially where I'm going to stop now because two months ago, George was looking at this exact thing and I'll let him talk about that. But we came together and uh, we've been able to put this model together that uh, George really developed it uh, because of his knowledge of sacred geometry. But it, it fits perfectly within all of the, uh, the experimental data results that I, I found in architecture and in nature. Um, so he's going to talk about that here in just a minute. To finish up, uh, if you're interested, I do make these personal meditation pyramids, you can go to stargatepyramids.com, use the code TESLA20, and you can receive 20% off of your order. And then finally, if you're interested in my book, uh, this is the title of it, 76.345, Exploring the Hidden Secrets of the Golden Ratio. And that's available uh, on Amazon in both Kindle and paperback editions. So I thank you for listening, if you're interested in contacting me, uh, you can contact me via email at charlie at stargatepyramids.com, or you can call me at 412-474-3481. And I thank you for listening. Great. Okay, I'm on. Great. Thanks, Steve, for putting me on, and I'm grateful to be here. Thanks, Charlie, for giving us that awesome tour again. And uh for the first time for the viewers. And uh, yeah, I'm gonna take it off really kind of focusing on the last three slides um, that Charlie was focused on there, or the last three, really the platonic solid connection, the fractals and the torus, and show how that fits into sacred geometry. Um, uh, a, a very uh, into sacred geometry and my YouTube channel is New Geometry, K-N-E-W Geometry. So please check that out. And I teach courses and things like that in sacred geometry. Um, but I didn't know Charlie, like he said, about two months ago. And I started to work trying to figure out this angle because I do a lot of work with the golden ratio. And I my attention was brought to the, the Russian pyramid, which is this blue pyramid here. And I figured out many techniques of how to create it. Now, you might be like, well, you probably could have just looked in a book to find that. But the amazing thing is, is that <laughs> all the sacred geometry books I have, there's not one book out there that shows you how to produce a 76.345 degree angle. So it's kind of like a hidden mystery in sacred geometry. Where is that angle? How do we produce it? So I set myself out to do that and then connected to Charlie after discovering many different techniques of how to do it and applied this angle to all these other elements of sacred geometry that I'm aware of. And you'll see those in just a moment. I think one thing that's just really amazing about this angle is it's the only, only angle in the universe <laughs> that will stack golden ratio, either spheres or circles. These are golden ratio circles, one on top of the other. There are four of them there. And this will go on to an infinite point at the top here. It's the only angle that will stack them that has a tangent line that runs to those spheres or circles. The connection I discovered here was it actually related to the Giza pyramid. And I have this little models here that I make a lot of models of these things that has the Giza pyramid and relationship between the bases are one, uh, excuse me, one for the Russian pyramid to 3.26. And that's, uh, you know, the, the phi ratio formula, divide that in half and you've got 1.618. And that's what this little diagram is showing here. So right away, I realized that these two structures in the golden ratio are intimately connected. Um, the next thing that I did, uh, you know, after connecting with Charlie, because I saw one of his presentations and saw that he was working with the platonic solids. And I got super excited about that because this is a view of the platonic solids that we don't see too often. Um, but I call it the square view because it basically this big black box here is a cube. And I was like, Charlie, I think that I could 
take this model and put it through a number of successions and do the same nesting that Robert Lawler did. And let's see what happens with the Russian pyramid as we do that. And once again, we saw that the phi scaling from one cube, which is way down in here at one, jumped from the next platonic solid, the next cube that showed up was 4.236. And then that jumped up the phi to the six, which was the 17.94 measurement. So this pyramid was at every successive stage in each of those jumps between the platonic solids, just like Charlie had um, seen with the numerics. Now we're getting some different images to this. And in our first meeting, I showed that to Charlie and I showed him my diagram here of how the in-sphere and out-sphere, I basically built Russian pyramids off of each one of these in-sphere and out-sphere. So that would be the sphere in one of the solids or around one of the solids. And they're all nested here. As soon as I showed this to Charlie, he got so excited because he saw that connection between this hieroglyph that I was unaware of at the time and what I did was I basically took the same drawing that I did and laid it over this hieroglyph and these uh, in spheres and out spheres of some of the major platonic solids in here lined up to the little channel that was cut in between the outer 76.345 pyramid and the inner one. And even that little notch in the bottom related to one of the solids in here. So we were just super excited about that. And then um, Charlie pointed me in the direction to check out the Aztec calendar. So I started to lay basically that same platonic solid image over that just to see how far back this image went into, our, into, into history. It was just phenomenal to see that almost every single angle, all these little triangles points here that are in here, and Charlie documents this in his book, um, R76.345. I was just amazed to see that the in-sphere and out-sphere of these platonic solid nesting, running that angle up, happened to coincide many of the key circle intersections or notches throughout the whole design. And I basically, all I did for this was just put the central circle inside this cube. This is a cube, this big square, put it right here and just let everything else play out just on its own. So that's basically where the face of the Aztec calendar is right at the middle of that. So this is just some real inspiration along the way. Um, but I wanna give you a little primer in the platonic solids. And this relates to maybe some of your, the viewers out there related to Dan Winter's work. I have a video on my channel where him and I discuss his model, this 3D fractal expansion of what he calls the star mother model. And uh, basically what this model is, is it contains the octahedron and the tetrahedrons to make the cube. And that's kind of what's going on inside the dodecahedron. And at that point, you basically stellate the dodecahedron, which is this little model here, stellated dodecahedron, which will create the icosahedron, which is this 20, you know, 20 sided platonic solid. And then if you stellate that model over here, this will stellate to reproduce another larger dodecahedron. Now right here you see this arrow is basically saying from one dodecahedron to the next is the phi cube scaling angle. Now that relates to all the fractality of the Mandelbrot set that Charlie was talking about. And that's why Dan calls this a 3D fractal expansion of the dodeca and icosa. And uh, it's all drawn within this diagram here. So I just found that all the techniques that I had come to related to this um, angle just fit beautifully into many of the discoveries that I had previously made. And then I just found it everywhere. It's just a more simplified example of that, taking out the platonic solids, just to show that the scaling angle will go on forever in a very fractal way. And now this is the new slide for Charlie that he hasn't seen but what I did this morning as I came up with, I was like, well, let's see where the pyramid angle, the 76.345, actually shows up as a double bi pyramid in each of the Mandelbrot set circles. So this is right over Richard Merrick's book of the interference, how we're going from one to phi cubed, uh, phi, phi cubed, phi to the sixth, phi to the ninth. And now we're seeing that this pyramid angle is with inside each of these expansions fractally. Now here's a nicer image with a little bit more color to it. And what I discovered also is that the Giza pyramid 
is actually related to this angle too of the fractality, because like I said before, the Russian pyramid and Giza pyramid are connected. Now, this is just from this morning, specifically for this slide. No one else has seen this before um, this presentation. So Charlie and I are going to have to decode this a little bit more. There's a lot to look at in the relationship of these circles. And notice here the base of the pyramid pretty much just comes out to this little uh, dimple here at the bottom. So it's just the magic, the way the sacred geometry lays over this. And so much is hidden within it and so much we can access from doing these simple line drawings, either with pencil or paper. Um, but of course, I use the precision of the computer for many of these drawings just to be accurate. This is one of the first drawings that, um, you know, that I produced that we got excited about as well was looking at the Russian pyramid as a cone, basically. So this is really, we're gonna get into the torus and the vortex of energy that's through this. And hopefully that someone out there is really into free energy will be inspired by working with this angle because this is really a, a cone of spiral energy that's moving around through this golden ratio stack spheres and I realized that this is it as a side view, and I have the cone here somewhere. I got it on the next slide too, but here's the cone. And if we look at it this way, you'll see it looks like golden ratio spheres. We'll see that better in the next slide. Um, golden ratio spirals. You can follow this around as if you're looking top down. And when you look at it from the top down, you'll see that each of these four spirals will kind of flow around. So look at that as golden ratio spheres stacked on top of one another. And that would all be a spiraling uh, vortex of energy going around that. Here's that cone again with the 76.345 angle. Really that pyramid is uh, really casing the outline of this cone that I feel is very significant is the, the cone because that's going to fit into the torus very nicely. Now, if we're looking at this from the side, it looks like a very steep angle, but from the top, there's your golden ratio spiral, and here it is from a few directions. Looks like a pine cone, and if you give that a little Fibonacci twist to it, then you'll have a pine cone from that. Okay, so here's the uh, slides with the torus, and, uh, you know, I put it into a structural geometry, which is the rhombic tricontahedron, this form right here. This is what relates to our Earth grid. Um, theorized by the Russian scientists and Becker and Hagen's earth grid and the ley lines. I might have taken out a slide of that. But basically, I found that the pyramid itself fits right within inside the sphere that fits within that form. So that sphere within that form that I'm showing here, the rhombic tricontahedron, that is what's considered the earth um, by some scientists, and that that will host the angle but then inside that and there's your golden ratio spheres and of course there's your spiraling energy and now here's your image that charlie showed you with the torus here's the spherical version of that and here's the torus going through the middle with the golden ratio stack spheres and this is what an example of that little opening would look like at the top with the spiral going down the center here is the earth grid by becker and Hagen's. there's a uh, zip file, I think, that you can get of that for uh, Google Earth. So you can lay out the ley lines right on top of that and take a look at uh, where they cross. Of course, this rhombic face would be where one of the spiral, where one of the uh, circles would be for the top of the cone. And um, I've also looked at this in a Dan Winters model of looking at the dodecahedron. So this is the 12-sided platonic solid. And looking how the cone angle will also fit right inside the central pentagon. So this pentagon right here, the pentagram in the middle, hosts the central circle, which is the top of the cone that goes straight down into the middle of this form. And if we go to the next slide, we'll see that we have a series of fractality again going on basically in units of phi here, one to phi to phi squared to phi cubed. And these cones, uh, this cone is going right to the center and those circles that you see stacked here, they're pretty much inside each pentagon. Now, just a little thing about why there's a pentagram on top of that dodecahedron. Well, each line of that pentagram is a cube 
in the form. So there are five cubes in the dodecahedron. So it's really the unification of those five cubes that if you make these five cubes, um, so here we can see from this angle, I've gotten larger. Oh, I disappeared now. <laughs> uh, okay, we're back to this. Okay, I'm back on. Here we go. So here's here's the uh, here's the cube that you could see. That edge right there, that is uh, one edge of one of the cubes. Each of these edges are a cube. And now that uh, circle that would be right in the middle of the little pentagon they make would be a location where one of those uh, spirals go in towards the center, one of the cones. All right, we're good with that. Hop me back over to the presentation, Steve. Thank you. So, um, yes, you know, it's creating a kind of uh, torse type of look around here, conceptual drawings. Um, uh, I've placed this into uh, Dan Winter's model. This is just, uh, you know, he uses an angle, which is the angle of the dodecahedron, the cone that goes into the dodecahedron. Uh, the spiraling vortex that goes through there creates the nodal points to create the golden ratio stack of spheres, which is the purple cone going into the middle. So that integrates beautifully right into some of the work that Dan's done already, and I've sent them this slide to uh, discuss. Charlie also mentioned uh, Victor Schauberger. Well, this is now the blue line is the Russian pyramid. And half the diameter of uh, the golden ratio circle that gets that kicked off, half the diameter of that will give us Schauberger's angle that he shows us, at least in this diagram, he's got a number of different devices that have different angles. Um, but at least this one, which I got very interested in because it's basically golden rectangles stacked one sideways, one on the sideways going back and forth, mm. kind of following this much like a shell. I believe he was studying a shell, a conical structure of a shell here, and produced this. Um, but basically that is can be found in the same relationship of the Russian pyramid right in the core of that as well. So really you have a lot of different angles, and I believe that Charlie and I want to go and look at a lot of these other steeples that he mentioned or yeah. the yeah. – you know, because we're going to see this angle showing up in some of these other uh, geometries. And uh, there's quite there's a few different angles. This one's about 84 or something, or 83 point something. So I think believe that was close to the one that Charlie. But as Charlie, right. you got to wonder where this, uh, this geometry went in our history, you know, and uh, it's, it's in historical architecture. But where is it documented? Uh, for the geometer like me who does these hand drawings and makes these type of connections really could find uh, can find no uh, other than the ones that I produced myself no uh, no no resource that shows me how to produce it um, but this is only from 300 years ago only it seems like quite a while to eliminate this angle um, but really this angle when I found this uh, angle in a diagram that someone sent to me after watching one of the Russian pyramid videos I did. I laid over the Russian pyramid on it, and it was an exact match to this diagram from about 300 years ago by the alchemist George von Welling. So it, this knowledge was uh, is out there and was out there, um, but very hidden in plain sight in many cases. Um, but the geometry, uh, it, you know, held the key to opening up the sacred geometry to rediscover it and find it, and get it back into the pattern of sacred geometry, as well as into the hands of enthusiasts who are interested in building technology, you know, free energy devices. Having a geometry you could work with and do the drawings is a great place to start. Um, you know, compass and straight edge is the old school way to do it. And that's the way I like to go about it. This diagram is very amazing, too, because uh, basically these pyramids are stacked in golden ratio scaling. And each of these uh, line circles in here that are golden ratio, they actually are matching exact, precise uh, circles on the diagram. So whoever drew this, or Von Welling who drew this, knew the golden ratio was incorporated throughout the design. It's amazing. One to five cubed showing up throughout. Um, but, you know, I drew this same double stack pyramid, uh, you know, a few days before that was sent to me. So it is hidden in the circle patterns. We can rediscover many of this lost geometry and begin to work with it again. Uh, sacred geometry, I believe, holds a golden key to remembering this. And these are just some modern creations that new geometers have made. 
um, you know, that uh, demonstrate how we can make beautiful art out of this and creative designs that are inspiring, as aspiring and inspiring when we start working with the these golden spires. Now, the uh, I have a, a Pinnacle Golden Ratio workshop, just so you know that I'm doing it right now. It's in progress. Charlie's part of that program. Um, it's, it's, <laughs> I'm a student. I'm Charlie, a student. Charlie's a student. <laughs> He's a very enthusiastic student, sharing a lot of his uh, his knowledge and insight and wisdom with us as well. But those are going to be recorded. All those sessions are recorded, and they're going to be available at New Geometry Courses. Check out the site. I've got a lot of their courses there teaching how to draw the platonic solids. It's a great class. There's going to be nothing like this, I believe, on Earth that teaches how to work with multiple ways to draw this. We're going to actually be uh, doing it all. Full, full, full way of doing this is building the pyramid, um, then showing you how to make the cone with all sacred geometry and drawn techniques to do the whole thing, just as if you were, you know, back in uh, 400 years ago or whatever. I uh, figured out all the techniques how to draw it, make the cone, and we're going to make the whole thing along with any different creative designs that can be done. So check that one out. I think you might really enjoy it. Uh, here's the slide that shows that and some of the drawing techniques that go along with this that I'm sharing with the group. So I really feel like, uh, you know, Charlie and I were joking on before. I've done a lot of amazing discoveries in sacred geometry, but I believe that this one is going to be a really important one um, to integrate back into the pattern language of sacred geometry and make it accessible to many more people. So another way you can connect, uh, you know, besides the new geometry courses is check out my Facebook group. Uh, invite, you know, uh, tell me you want to be part of it. I'll plug you into the group. About 2,500 ge geometers on there sharing all sorts of great, awesome insights. And they're going off with the Russian pyramid and Giza pyramid. There's so many pyramid angle drawings on there. It's mind blowing right now how inspired they got. They really set them off. So hopefully I'll see you there and maybe you'll add your insights. I'm sorry I wasn't able to keep up with the comments on the right there. I was just in the roll, but maybe we can answer some questions at the end. So uh, thank you very much for uh, attending. And Charlie, thanks for having me. And Steve, thanks for all the great navigating of uh, popping me in and out there. Thanks for having me on the show. Okay. Well, I'd like to bring everyone's attention to the uh, caller line we have. You know, you can come on the studio here and ask your questions directly. I'll also put in the comments. Take the comments you can click on, but you can't do it on the uh, screen. So, um, but anyway, I'd like to thank uh, Charlie and uh, George for being here. I think you guys did a great presentation. I know a lot of people are interested. And I expect to see a lot more people uh, checking this this uh, out over the week here. You know, And uh, I'd like to remind people about our conference coming up um, in um, Albuquerque. And who knows, maybe uh, Charlie and George will be there, I'm hoping. So no, we'll no, find no, that no. out later, though. And uh, is there anything anyone else has to say? If not, I'll just go ahead and. I, 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 Steve, I did see one question I might tackle from earlier. Somebody asked, well, what if the uh, the angle is just slightly different? You know, I think they said 76, 344. Well, you know, as, as I said at the outset, this is. This um, angle is uh, is never precise to begin with, because it's something that the to, to kind of go into how how scaling works. We're, my model, the model that we're going to be proposing, ultimately will use the Fibonacci sequence, which is just a recursive formula. You take two numbers and either add them together or subtract one from the other, and you continue that process. That results in uh, what's called a phi convergence. You, you converge towards phi, but you never achieve it. And of course, phi itself is unachievable because it's an infinitely ir irrational number. So what there is in plasma physics, just to get back to the, to the question, there's something called Landau damping. And essentially what it says is that you know, once you would establish a dominant waveform inside anything, any other kind of 
you know, subsidiary waveforms are going to be sucked into that. So I'm not going to try to say that that works for forever, but I think that nature has this Lando damping concept in there so that scaling can actually take place. And I will also point out, as most people know, that that uh, fractals, for example, they don't they're not exactly the same at each scaling level, there's always a minor change. And I think that's due to this idea of phi convergence, because we're never going to get to phi perfectly. So I don't know if that answers the question or not, but um, hopefully that's of some helpful to the person who asked that question. And we also have a question down below. Do you have any info on what type of capacitors were used to capture the voltage at the top of the film? No. No, I don't. Uh, the the uh, research from Russia just said that they used capacitors. So I don't. And unfortunately, as I said, you know, the, the only information we have are some abstracts that talk about the results. So I don't have a lot of specifics. So I am looking for somebody who knows electricity, uh, you know, to work with us to, 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 you know, who might be able to answer that question more fully. And also, I want to develop this and actually demonstrate it here in the U.S. And here's a question. Is there anything George covered in the 76.345 book? No. <laughs> Everything that George is covering is not in the book. And George and I have talked about this now that we've met. We're, we're in discussions. We may do either a volume or version two of this, the second edition, to include George's stuff in, or George may decide to do a separate book on this. We haven't really decided how we're going to do that. But, uh, George, have you ha got any further thoughts on that idea? Oh, well, you know, other than that, we've uh, discussed that and talked about it. I think um, probably... Uh, either doing a second edition, your book is so huge already, I think uh, including that information towards the end where you started to elaborate on or just making a, a second a second volume maybe might work and, and going yeah. really hashing out that new material would probably right. be adequate, you know, quite a bit. So we're definitely gonna be exploring that. And we have a couple other, uh, you know, videos out too and uh, the, the coursework and doing the drawings. We have so much content we want to put out there. So we're definitely going to have more publications for sure. And, and I, I guess I'll announce this now. I've been working to put together a video version of my book. I've, I've now downloaded all of the slides into a gigantic PowerPoint presentation. I believe I'm going to take George's work as well and so we're going to have have that in there as well. So for those of you who are interested, hopefully in the next month or so, uh, we could have this uh, video version of the book out uh, for public consumption. I'd like to comment, you know, I, I used to have a picture. I don't know where it would be at right now, but I believe it's in the 1986 Tesla Proceedings um, of um pyramid on top of a Tesla coil, and the discharge pattern was actually like a, um, what do you call yes. that, spiral? You know? Yeah, yes, I have that, I have that picture in my, in my, in my slide files, yeah, yeah, yeah it's pretty cool. Uh, one that I, for some reason, didn't get in tonight, I guess I must have copied it, or, or cut it and pasted, rather than copy and paste, was the, is the, uh, Theravanamali temple in uh, India. It's a Southern Dravidian style. And I apologize that it wasn't in tonight. But uh, one of the things that, uh, you know, we find is that all of those temples, uh, or at least, at least one in particular, this Theravanamali temple had a gigantic Tesla coil buried into the ground. Uh, and that was part of the free energy technology that the uh, Hindu temples used as well. So absolutely right. And I'd also like to point out that all energy um, moves in spirals, whether it be like yes. a weather formation, you know, because people don't, don't realize that weather is nature's way of transferring the energy from one part of the earth to another. And you always see it moving in spirals, you know, hurricanes, tornadoes and that. And um, 
and the and the more global warming takes hold here or climate change, the more intense the weather is. But it's all moving in spirals, and you should pay attention to that. You know, and right. uh, and you also can see it like if you look in a vacuum, and you have a uh, I forget what you call it. Uh, a discharge point inside the vacuum there, and you put your finger on the outside, you can see the uh, uh, a spiral or vortex of energy going to your finger, you know, uh, and these vacuum jars yep. and that. So it's pretty cool stuff. You know, just to emphasize that all energy moves in a spiral. You know, it's one of the basic forms of nature. So, I see one of the questions here, too, is uh, from Maria. What's your take on base 10 versus base 12? I haven't looked at base 12, but I will tell you that I'm, I've, I'm already in my head starting to develop a, a dynamic model inside the torus. And I think I'm going to, what I found is that you can take any two uh, not initial numbers in a Fibonacci sequence and scale from that point, you know, just like you would in the Fibonacci sequence, you can, if you reduce those numbers and it doesn't matter what two numbers you start with, but if you take that series of numbers, which is infinite uh, or can be infinite and reduce them to base nine, you find, I, I've seen this in other literature that you end up with three sequences of 24 numbers, which will then repeat uh so you see a, 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 a cyclical nature uh in in that and in addition to those three numbers you get series with three sixes and nines so it's all classic vortex mathematics like uh, marco Roden has demonstrated so i think that's gonna you know when i have time i'd like to develop the model a bit more fully we just roughed it out in today's presentation but now i think we can actually get into a dynamic the model uh, as we proceed forward. And base nine may be the answer. Okay, well, with that, I'm going to call it a night, and I'd like to thank you guys for being there. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. You get the conference and encourage everyone out there to get signed up for the conference. The earlier the better. We have a 35% discount right now. So please come to the conference and get signed up. Thank you very much. I'll see you next week.